Getting Back Together, How to Reintegrate the 21st Century Family in Work and Provision. Join me, Dr. Thomas Lamar, on this episode of Christian Heritage on Air as we welcome Kevin Swanson, host of Generations Radio and director of Generations with Vision. For more information, visit ChristianHeritageOnAir.com. Christian Heritage on Air is a production of Christian Heritage Home Educators of Washington. This webinar recorded on August 27, 2013. Dr. Thomas Lamar. I'm a homeschooling father of seven, chiropractor by trade, a guy who loves to podcast, and your host for Christian Heritage On Air, a program which looks to encourage, teach, and inspire you with biblical vision for your family and the home education process. Well, welcome once again, Dr. Thomas Lamar with you for Christian Heritage On Air. So glad to have you join us. Real excited about our guests for this particular episode as we gear up for the upcoming 2013 Family Economics and Mentorship Conference to be held in Ocean Shores, Washington, October 11 and 12, which, by the way, I'm told as we broadcast this evening live out over the Internet on August 27, 2013, I'm told it's nearly sold out. So if you've been sitting on the fence as to whether or not to attend this vision-packed nuts and bolts conference on family economics and mentorship, waste not another minute and reserve your spot by signing up over at ChristianHeritageOnline.org. Featured speakers include Kevin Swanson, R.C. Sproul Jr., Eric Weir, Diego Rodriguez, Steve Verdell, and Dave Tucker. Once again, the conference is all about family economics and mentorship. Last episode, we discussed the mentorship aspect. An episode, by the way, that is being heralded by some as being our best episode yet (laughs) with two gentlemen that have a proven track record of a three-year mentorship relationship together. Mentor and featured speaker at the conference, Steve Riddell, and his mentee and producer of Christian Heritage On Air, Danny Craig. So be sure to check that out and, uh, and to share it with others. And you can find that and all the other archived episodes over at ChristianHeritageOnAir.com. So last episode, our, our best episode to date, apparently, we, uh, we focused on the mentorship aspect of the conference. And on this episode, which has a high probability of becoming our newest best episode to date, we're going to focus on the economics aspect of the conference. But before we launch into it, I've got a little housekeeping for our live audience. Let me just say, uh, thank you so much if you're joining us live. We, we really do appreciate you carving the time out of your busy schedules. Uh, that's not to say, however, that we do not appreciate those of you uh, on, the, uh, on the time shift with us through iTunes, YouTube, or, or listening right there on ChristianHeritageOnAir.com website. Um, you know, actually, we're super excited to have you tune in because it's this aspect of the technology that allows us to serve you when you need it and wherever you may be. But for those of you joining us live, uh, you know, you know that one of the benefits of doing so, besides getting a behind the scenes peek of our production and uh, which may include a blooper or two, is that uh, you have the ability to ask questions. And so for our live attendees, we will have a Q&A session in the latter part of our program. And we want to encourage you to type your questions in the chat box once we get underway and, and type them in kind of as they come to you. And uh, we'll get those all queued up and ready. As always, we invite your feedback, uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, so we can best serve you and know whether we're hitting the mark. And you can do that at ChristianHeritageOnAir.com. And if you like what you're hearing, well, you know, please let us know, of course. But more importantly, let your friends know, too. Okay, what do you say we shoot for producing our newest best episode to date? On the program tonight... You know, many of us have been witness to the disintegration of family relationships over the last few decades and responded by integrating relationship and character into our homes and our children's lives. But what about the 80% or more of real life, not directly connected to classroom learning? What about our family's work, budget, finances, higher education and vocational training, health care, inheritance, and overall financial vision? 
Do each of our families have a unified, integrated vision of where we will be in 5, 10, and 20 years from now? And will our families be able to accomplish that together as a family? Helping us to unpack the task of getting back together and reintegrating the 21st century family in work and provision is the director of Generations with Vision and host of a highly popular international radio program, Generations Radio. It is my extreme pleasure to welcome to our microphones, Mr. Kevin Swanson. Kevin, welcome to Christian Heritage on Air. It's great to be with you. Thank you, Dr. Lamar. This is great. <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. Let, let me just say, um, yeah. as, as someone who has loved the medium of radio, uh, dating way back to my days as a teen playing radio DJ in the attic of my home with a Radio Shack mixer and a souped-up Mr. Microphone transmitter, you know, I always get a little excited when I have the opportunity to interview someone in radio. You know, it's funny. I had the same experience. Uh, I would I would always copy the DJs when I was you know fourteen or fifteen years old, homeschooled out in the islands in Japan. We used to listen to American Force and Korean Network or the uh, Voice of America through shortwave radio. My dad bought me a shortwave radio when I was about twelve or thirteen years of age, and I, I would copy the DJs and really you know. D- practice it and all the rest. And then when I hit the state side at 16 or 17 years of age, I, I immediately wa- walked down to some radio stations and, and, empl- and uh, applied to, uh, to try to get a job. And, uh, and since then, I've been in radio, I think, almost nonstop since, say, 1983 or so. Oh, that is so cool. I, I could talk to you all hour about this. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, but but I, I, I promise everyone, we are going to talk about the reintegrating the 21st century family work and provision. But Kevin, humor me for just a moment. Can you take us back to the early days of Generation Radio? How did that, that vision all come about? Well, it was all part of my radio background. I always loved radio. And of course, I couldn't get by on four and a half bucks an hour, which is what your average DJ was making, you know, out of college in the small markets. And so I, I, I had my foot in the, the, the business almost nonstop through the 1990s. Finally, about 2001, 2002, I decided to start a radio program in association with Christian Home Educators of Colorado. I was executive director for the organization at that time and, and uh, started a, a, a radio program out of uh, Colorado Springs and worked, uh, worked that on a weekly basis for the first First year, and then uh, a year after that, we went full time every every day, and we've been every day for I think nine years now. And then somehow that kind of morphed with you doing it out of the basement. Well, yeah, eventually we brought it home. <laughs> it was the most convenient <laughs> to get into our own uh, home studio. Uh, we were doing radio station studios up until say about seven or eight years ago, and then uh, pulled it into the basement. And ever since, we've been working outside of the basement. It's it's, it's great because I was I was sick last week, uh, five six days. I was I was sick in bed, but crawled downstairs a couple of times and uh, propped the microphone up against my face, and and we we broadcasted despite the fact I was suffering badly from some some pretty bad illness. Illnesses. Oh man, uh, did that one go out on, on video? <laughs> uh, no, no, no. You, you you keep it off of video as much as you can. Nice thing about audio, you can do it in your pajamas. Nobody nobody knows the diff. <laughs> That's right. Hey, just to geek out a little bit more before we get onto the meat and potatoes. Uh, one of the things that we're doing tonight or should I say attempting to do, is a special interview technique on the production side, uh, kind of a behind-the-scenes thing here, called a double ender. So for those of you listening to the recording of this, uh, if the audio sounds amazing, like Kevin is right in the same room with me, then we scored. Otherwise, uh, it's a good thing that we have a plan B. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. Let's go. (laughs) All right. Hey, let's talk about family economics. Uh, You know, here at Christian Heritage Home Education of Washington, uh, we are all about home education. We're all about the home education process. And of course, we have our annual Christian Heritage Family Discipleship and Homeschool Conference. We have uh, other opportunities throughout the year to, to workshop and fellowship around this idea. But now we're being introduced to another idea, and that is the idea or concept of family economics. Kevin, what exactly is family economics and, and how and where do our efforts of home education and family discipleship fit into it? Well, family economics is the broad picture of what I think every homeschool family is trying to do anyway. Uh, home education is just one small slice of it. When we bring our children home, we reintegrate them back into the nuclear family. The nuclear family has been largely derelevantized over the years, largely because of the compulsory attendance laws, the the child labor laws and things that came through the 18th, uh, 1800s, 1900s. Um, the family became really, really irrelevant. Dad left the family farm. Uh, mom left the family farm. Uh, the, the kids ran off to their age segregation classrooms, and over time, the family became fairly irrelevant, but for maybe a meeting at McDonald's every third day or so. 
And and so there are a lot of us who came back and said, hey, I think the family is relevant, family is important, and the family should be working together and playing together and resting together. And if you look at the Bible, you'll find that the Bible assumes a family economy. In fact, the Fourth Commandment talks about resting from our weekly labors, but we rest as a family. Uh, six days a week, we're working as a family, and on the seventh day, it's the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. You shall not do any work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your manservant maid servant, etc. The assumption, of course, is that sons and daughters work side by side with with the, their fathers and mothers, and this happened for 5,910 years or so until the modern age where the families have been disintegrated, the uh, the children uh, are shuffled off to socialist classrooms, and uh, and the family economy is pretty much non-existent. I want to dig a little deeper. Um, we're, you've touched on the f- fact that the family is disintegrating. Why is it so vital, though, that that we we really put a big emphasis on family economics? Well, I think it's because the family is important. And the fact that you have 42% of kids born outside of wedlock up from 6% in the 1970s is problematic. But, uh, but also, y- y- you lose the opportunity to disciple your children. And, and the whole experience of a child being raised is not just to set them before books. The idea that education is just books and you're cramming knowledge into a kid's mind all day long is, is, is substandard. It's, it, it doesn't work. It, it, it's proven itself to be um, inefficient, ineffective. And, uh, you know, a recipe for disaster is to take a seven or eight year old boy, give him four to five hours of boring desk work every day, and then let him play computer games for the rest of the day and do that for 18 years out of his life. Uh, that is probably a recipe for disaster. It's been proven to be a recipe for disaster. And people are discovering that seven, eight, nine, ten year old boys, uh, need to be doing more than book work all day long. What should they do? What have they been doing for the last 5,900 years of world history? You're going to find that they work side by side with dad in the fields. Uh, they were working the family economy. Uh, Joseph was feeding his father's sheep. David was feeding his father's sheep. Rachel was feeding her father's sheep. Rebecca was feeding her father's sheep. Uh, later on in the New Testament, Aquila and Priscilla, they were tent makers together as a team. See, this kind of thing has existed s- since the beginning. This is what God intended from the beginning for man and woman. But, but the modern corporate world, the modern college life, the modern academic life has fragmented the family economy, and it's, uh, it's, it's slowly breaking down the opportunities for disciples discipleship uh, within the home. Uh, and and I think over time, it's going to yield a fracturing of society. You break down a family that way over about five to six or seven generations, inevitably, you're going to see a socioeconomic system break down before you. And that's, I think, what we're seeing happening right now. I agree. You, you, you wrote an article on this topic, uh, the family is dying a slow and miserable death in the West, and that the family has disintegrated in the 21st century. If, if that's the case, which it is. Kevin, how do we pull out of it? Well, I think the only real possibility is to find ways to reintegrate the family economy, provide opportunities for discipleship, and and we're doing just that, and I think we're finding opportunities uh, to do this. Remember, in 1930, 70% of 15-year-old boys were still working their fa- father's farm. Uh, that's now at about a half a percent. So just in the last uh, about 85 years, we've seen a huge drop-off of boys that were able to be working at 13 or 14 or 15 years of age. And and, and now we're, we're seeing that whatever we're doing is not working. 70 to 80 percent of boys are not grown up by 30 years of age, up from 30 percent in 1970. That means that they're not getting jobs, they're not getting married, they're pretty much irrelevant. Of the millennial generation, 61 percent of these homes are being provided for by the woman as the primary bread maker, a breadwinner, and uh, it's only 17% for men as the primary breadwinners right now in the nuclear family among millennials, which means that men are relevant. Men aren't ready for work. Men are able to provide for their families. And the assumption is that somehow women will be able to sustain economies for the next 20, 30, 40 years without the aid of men. And somehow the family is going to survive. It's not going to survive. We're going to have to find ways to redo the entire socioeconomic system. And I think the best way to do it is to get back to the biblical pattern of the family economy and uh, and build it peacefully piece by piece. Now, there are thousands of ways to do it. You know, we're not asking dad just to drop his corporate job and come home overnight. That's not, that's not necessarily the solution for every family. There are many, many, many options for families, and we're exploring these options in our family economics conferences that take place all around the country. And we're going to talk a little bit more about uh, what that might look like in just a moment, but I, I wanted to get back to that article that you wrote. You, you said that, you know, we need to reconstruct the biblical family. What does that mean? 
Well, I think the first and foremost thing is that dad becomes irrelevant to the family. Not, not just relevant as a guy who brings home the bacon, a guy who leaves the house and, and his, he doesn't have any kind of a family vision, doesn't do family worship, there's no real family discipleship going on. He's pretty much disconnected to the family with the exception of maybe providing a little bit of a paycheck. Now that worked for about half of a generation or maybe one generation, but by the time you get to the present generation, as I said, it's not working anymore. Uh, now we need a double income at least and, and the uh, man is becoming increasingly increasingly irrelevant and eventually will become entirely irrelevant unless we get back to a family-based economy, as we've talked about. So we have to bring the father back into a position of relevance. He must become the leader of the home. He must become the visionary of the home. He must become a prophet, a priest, a king within the home. Uh, He has to reconnect with his family. He has to see himself as belonging in the family, 724s. One of the things we saw as, as homeschool leaders in Colorado was that moms were reintegrating the families. Moms were coming home. Mom and, and children were re- integrated, but for the most part, dads weren't reintegrating, and we found that with dads, this was somewhat frustrating. Uh, We found that the homeschooling was sort of a half-baked solution, kind of a halfway house towards reintegrating the family. And so over the years, we found that we've got to bring dad into the process. And a part of the way of doing this is to reintroduce dad to the entire family economic vision, give him the vision, figure out how many uh, streams of income they're gonna, he's going to oversee in that household and, uh, and start building that family economy as he would build a team. Mm-hmm. You know, um, I just want to spend a little more time on this. On, on your website, uh, you have a short video that promotes your radio program. And in that video, you say something that I think is, is so very important. You've been saying it for the past five minutes or so. And, and it, it certainly flies in the face of what our culture promotes, but it is key. And, and this is what you said, and it's almost in passing. You said, here at Generations, we have a different way of looking at the world. When dad gets a vision, everything changes. Can you talk to us a little bit more about how everything changes? Well, when dad gets a vision, he realizes that that he has an impact to make in life. And the impact is primarily not his work. It's not his political position. It's not his the, the impact he's going to make through all these other things. His primary impact will be by way of what he does with his own family. What, what he does as he raises his children as a legacy for future generations, uh, that will be his primary impact. I think every father sort of knows that, uh, but he, 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 he's been kind of derelevantized in his family. And, uh, and after a while, by the time he's in his forties, he comes to realize about the only impact he's going to make is his, his workplace. And that's what he focuses on. But, uh, but my, my encouragement is for the father to, to realize who he is as a father, as a husband, in the home, and, and to see that family economy as, as, as central to, to the impact he's going to make, especially in the lives of the individuals that he disciples. There's, there's nothing more important that we do in our life than to disciple our own children. I have to remind myself of this all the time because I speak to tens of thousands of people almost every single day. But when I spend an, about an hour with my children in the morning, uh, singing the hymns and the psalms and reading the Word of God and, and, and really just sitting back and talking to them, you know, I'll spend 30, 40, 50 minutes just talking to my children. I just enjoy doing this. Uh, I'm discipling them. I'm pointing out sins that the family is struggling with. We repent of those sins. We pray together. And uh, that, that by far is the most important thing I do any day. Uh, even if I, you know, spend the afternoon talking to, 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 to important people on the, on the radio as I'm doing right now. What about the wife that's listening right now? And she's wondering, you know, how can I support my my husband to bring about this vision or, or at least, you know, be there as a catalyst? Can you maybe speak to that? Well, I think that's really important. We've talked about fathers and sons. We need to talk about mothers and daughters as well. Proverbs 31 is really the key chapter that really brings the, the mom into the picture of the family economy. In fact, that, 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 that chapter is about the family economy. It says, the heart of her husband does safely trust in her so that he shall have no need to spoil. Who's he talking about? 
It's talking about the heart of her husband safely trusting her. It doesn't say the heart of her co- corporate boss safely trusting her so that he shall have need no spoil. It doesn't say the heart of her her bureaucracy or the hospital administration that oversees her safely trusting her so that they shall have no need to spoil. It says the heart of her husband safely trusts in her so that he shall have no need to spoil. I think it's important for our, our wives to understand that this is the broader vision. I realize it's a paradigm shift. You know, we, we our, our young Young ladies are trained to go to college and get their career and get their job and find their self worth and their position uh, in the company and and seeing their lives as as this this uh, autonomous uh, life that is apart from her husband or family and all the rest. But but that's not the way that Proverbs thirty one looks at the family economy or at the the woman's uh, role in that household. Ultimately, she's she's one uh, with her husband. She is the axe head on the axe handle that is able to to produce so much more, that is able to to gain so much more dominion. Uh, uh, think about how many trees you can take down if you just had an axe head. You know, you sit there trying to dink, dink, dink away at the tree. You're not going to cut down many trees. Or if you take an axe handle and you just whack, whack, whack a tree, you're not going to cut down many trees. But if you put the axe head on the axe handle, as as a woman was made for the man, and then they get married, they go out, they take dominion together, they team up together, take dominion together, see themselves as a team together in the economic venture that God has given to them. I, I think you're going to see way, way more dominion, way more productivity in family economies than you do when you fragment uh, husbands and wives. You know, we've been talking kind of about the, uh, the the landscape of what it really looks like out there now, and the, the nuclear family is disintegrating. And if that's the if that's the case, which it is, and the divorce rates, you know, in the fifty percent area, what about the single moms out there that are listening, going, "Well, what am I going to do?" Well, my encouragement again for the single moms is is form that family economy. See uh, their children as part of that economy. I mean, we have single moms in our church. We have one particular one uh, that that really has taken this vision on on in a significant way, and her boys are really engaging this, and her 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 boy, uh, her oldest son, I've been mentoring some. I believe that mentorship plays right into this vision, so please, you know, include the mentorship aspect to this as well, but uh, as, as I've mentored her sons and as they have contributed to their, fa- their family economy at 16 or 17 years of age, uh, these young men are receiving a little bit of a paycheck from myself and others, and I have seen them write checks. I've seen them sign the check over to their mother to contribute to the household rent uh, in any given month, and it's a beautiful thing to see that those boys understand that it is not their money, it is the household's money, and, and, and they want to contribute to the household. They, they want to provide for their own mother. And think about this. If you have young men at 16 or 17, 18 years of age, uh, thinking about this, taking it seriously, they should provide for their own mothers. Uh, they certainly will be ready to provide for their households, uh, in the first Timothy 5, 8, uh, mandate by the time they're, you know, 22, 23 years of age and they're ready to get married. So this is really the goal. This is the goal for all of our young men that, that they begin to understand how to provide for the family income of the family economy as early as perhaps 10 or 12 or 14 years of age so that they won't be, you know, of the 70% of young men who aren't grown up by 30 years of age, up from 30% in 1970, and, and the virtual destruction we're seeing uh, upon families and, of course, the entire macro economy in America right now because we just do not have young men who are trained in family economies early on. They're not mentored early on by their fathers or by mentors. They're not prepared to contribute to their family economies early on. I think single moms most definitely need to participate in this as well. This is this is very important. Now, if they have young men, I really encourage them to seek out mentors in their churches, uh, as we have done in our church. Um, we, we just, you know, absolutely need to need to do this kind of thing if, if these young men are not going to continue the uh, the pattern that was set by previous generations. Oftentimes, their fathers didn't know how to provide and were not prepared to provide themselves for their families. You know, uh, there's probably a dad listening right now saying, wow, you know, I want to <laughs> I, I, I want to do this. You know, so let, let's get a little practical here and have you kind of paint a picture of what a family based economy might look like. You uh, said in, in one of your articles, you said, when folks ask me if we are a one income family or a two income fl- family, I tell them that we are a seven income family. So tell us more about how this kind of works. Well, I, you know, I, I, I want to encourage people to see that there, there really are 
almost no limits to what we can do when we start opening up this family economic vision. And the first thing I tell them all is come down to a conference. You know, there are thousands of ideas we discuss. The panels are critical because there are, there's no, family that does it like any other family. Uh, there is no paint by numbers approach. Uh, everybody takes these things differently, but we, we need to apply all these ideas and, and then work out vision for our own individual families in this. Uh, but my encouragement is, is to come up with, uh, ideas in which the family can, can integrate, the family can get involved. And, uh, that doesn't mean that you have to come home overnight. That, that may mean that you all want to add, uh, all, 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 uh, other family economic streams. So that's why I talk about multiple streams. There are some families who can handle a single stream. Uh, the family farm is typically a single stream. That is, you know, a family pulls together and everybody works the farm and they, they all yield the fruit at the end of the year. But that typically doesn't happen for most families, at least in the present day, especially if you live in the urban areas. You're probably going to have to add other income streams to the family, uh, come up with ideas uh, of things that your children can do with you. Uh, and and if, if they can't do you know, certain things, then start, start little entrepreneurial endeavors that they can do themselves, even if it's something as simple as a lemonade stand or something like that, or, or yard work, for example. Uh, but there are hundreds, if not thousands of ideas that families can incorporate, uh, into this. Now, of course, ideally, uh, fathers often like to come home and want to come home and they want to, uh, perhaps find ways to open up an office in the home, do more contractual labor, uh, or, or start their own entrepreneurial endeavor. But, but every family is different. And I, I, you know, we got to be very, very careful that we don't uh, say every family's got to start some entrepreneurial thing tomorrow and dad's got to come home from his work and so forth. We don't want to say that. But uh, I do think it's important for our sons and for our daughters to start thinking about how they can get involved in the family economic income streams and uh, that from the get-go. Now, there's another aspect to that, this and that is family ministry and family hospitality. We want to talk about that too because it's not just the quid pro quo, let's just make sure our family is making a lot of money uh, by developing seven or eight or ten income streams. No, let's let's also talk about family ministry and family hospitality. Uh, we can talk about taking care of our parents in their old age. We can talk about inheritance. We can talk about, I mean, once you start opening up family economies, you realize there's a hundred different things to talk about. It's just that most of this has been lost due Due to the fact that the family has been so fractured and fragmented over the last two to three generations. Mm, yeah. Are there any current day challenges that we need to be aware of um, as we bring our family into uh, some sort of workforce, like, you know, child labor laws, that kind of stuff? You know, every state has different child labor laws, but generally speaking, if, if, if the children work within the home for the family, there is a huge amount of protection for those families. And, and that's largely because the, it was the family farm that was being protected, even as they were incorporating child labor laws for kids that were working in the corporate uh, scene. But we don't want our kids working in the corporate scene, generally speaking. That's not our goal. And so much of the child labor laws don't apply to the, the, the average family that's trying to engage a family economy. So just kind of keep that in mind. Remember, initially, uh, children were moved from the family farms to the corporations. The corporations owned the kids for a period of time. And then with the child labor laws and the compulsory tennis laws, the children were moved out of the corporations over into the state where the government then owned the children. What we're saying is we don't want corporations owning our children. We don't want governments owning our children. We want our children to be with us because God has appointed us to disciple our children as we sit in the house, as we walk by the way, as we plow our fields, as we rise up, as we lie down, God wants children with families, and let's find ways to reincorporate that. And believe it or not, I think much of the child labor laws still uh, allow for a huge amount of liberty and freedom for the average family. Now, over the last couple of years, the Barack Obama administration has tried really, really hard to 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 cinch up on the child labor laws for family farms and family businesses to the point where, where uh, kids couldn't use wheelbarrows and ki- kids couldn't even carry around flashlights and things. Uh, but, but thankfully, by God's grace, they were not successful. So the family could still reintegrate their own children into their family farms and family businesses. So for the time being, there's still a fair amount of freedom, but I would still encourage people to check out their child labor laws in their respective states. That's some great advice. Um, Talk to the father right now who's listening and saying, hey, I, I, I want to do this, uh, but I just I don't see the vision. I, so what, what sorts of questions or what sort of process does he need to go through to start to create this vision that you're talking about? 
Well, I think the first thing he has to do is he has to look at this big picture vision for his family. What What is my family all about? What is my family supposed to be doing? What are the gifts, talents, and abilities that God has given to us? Uh, what are the challenges before us? What's what's what really in our heart? What what do we really want to see happen? Maybe there's a family that really wants to get involved in media and making movies. They've they've seen some of the lousy stuff coming out of Hollywood. They're thinking, well, I can do better than that. I certainly have a better worldview, and I would love to start expressing that worldview in the visual arts. Okay, we'll do that then. Maybe there's a family that's got just just a passion for the pro-life movement. You know, they they want to see an end of abortion in the state of Washington or the state of Oregon or the state of Colorado. Okay, well, you know, get your family involved in some political races and uh, maybe work the personhood amendment, which is now sweeping different states, uh, starting in Mississippi, it's hit Colorado and a few other states. Uh, it doesn't really matter, you know, what you do. Again, it does not have to be an income stream overnight. Just ask yourself. What does God want our family doing? What are our gifts, talents, and abilities, and how can we best employ them? I think it's best to start with kind of a big picture thing. I I had a family vision statement that I wrote about uh, 14 years ago, which, by the way, we're still working off of 14 years later. It it involved starting a radio ministry that would reach 50,000 people, okay? Now, I'm about halfway there, believe it or not, on that one. It involved a, 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 a goal to write 20 books. I've written about 12 or 13, and my my daughter's writing one right now, and she's almost finished with that. Uh, you know, and, and there's probably a discipleship center in our basement. That was one of the things I had put on my list about 14 years ago. Sure enough, we started that about four years ago. So, so we started all these different things that was on my heart, and believe it or not, uh, after writing all those things out and beginning to chip, chip, chip away on those goals, we are at the point now, we have so much going on in this house that uh, we, we do not have extra time to do much of anything else. You know, if you said, you know, is your daughter, are your daughters kind of sitting around trying to figure out what to do with their life, not one bit. Uh, we are so busy. Uh, we can barely get all the schoolwork done and the work done and the ministry work done and the hospitality work done in any given day. Of course, we try to squeeze in a little vacation here and there, but uh, but just you know, writing out that vision statement and then over the years working it has been extremely productive. One of the things I would also encourage families to do is try to start on this when your children are fairly young. I started this vision statement about, what was it, 14 years ago, and my oldest son would have been about eight years old. My daughters would have been six, four, two, kind of in that range. And well, over time, as we've progressed, you know, our children have gotten to the point where they're old enough to fulfill much of this vision for us. But if I hadn't started the vision early on, uh, we wouldn't have anything for them to do when they were in their teenage years. Uh, so I think the, the real encouragement is to try to start early with this vision. Uh, maybe dad's in the corporate world. I was when we first started writing these, uh, these vision statements, these mission statements. Uh, but, but you know, it took, took some time to kind of work my way out of the corporate world. And we worked the double income, triple income, quadruple income streams for a while. And uh, gradually I weaned myself from the corporate world. And now we're uh, busier than a hot, than a cat on a hot tin roof on the 4th of July. <laughs> so what, what sort of metric would you suggest that fathers use? I mean, you, you mentioned that it's really not about making the money, although that's going to come, but is it, is it being busy? Is that, is that what you want to look for? Well, I, I think you want to start with your gifts and abilities and your vision. You know, what, what does God put on your heart? What, what do you think you really need to do? Uh, what would you have to do before you died? You know, if you died before you got something done, would you be bummed out? That kind of thing. <laughs> and so you write those things down and, and you, you figure out, I think it's not just the money. It's, it's ultimately what do you want to do? Now, at that point, I'd split it into two aspects. One is family ministry element and the other is a family business element. So I, I just like to think of a family economy is made up of family business where you got the quid pro quo, the income expenses happening, and the family ministry where it's not so much quid pro quo. You're doing hospitality. You're, you've got a family ministry. Maybe you're getting involved in politics and doing things that just don't make any money really, but but are important to the family vision. What I would do is I'd, I'd put a percentage on each side. I'd say, you know, I think we as a family, you know, we're we're probably, our family is probably 70% ministry and 30% quid pro quo uh, businesses on the side. We're largely ministry. Most of what we do as a family economy is ministry, uh, but that's not your typical family. Some families are going to say, we're going to be 80% business, 20% hospitality ministry. Uh, I would lay out some of those those ratios and, and just try to figure out what you're going to be. It's also, it is good to set out goals for your family. You know, if you want to pay off the house by the year, 
2018 and and you want to have an income of $120,000 on some particular income stream by the year 2018, that's fine. That's fine. Lay out those goals. That's a good thing to do. But uh, but but ultimately, I think our what we're supposed to be doing is is what we're supposed to be doing. So let's let's lay out uh, the, the the goals and the the vision that God has given to us. And uh, the money aspect, the number aspect, probably not quite as important. Now, it was important for me that I I laid out uh, the goal that my radio efforts uh, would reach fifty thousand people. That was really important to me. I, that number fifty thousand was something I thought about for a long time. Now, again, I didn't have any number in terms of okay, I'm going to have a you know seven point four million dollar radio property by the year twenty eighteen. I didn't do that, but I did say I want to be speaking to fifty thousand people by the year uh, twenty sixteen. I think it was. All right, we're starting to get some uh, questions queuing up for our Q and A session, which is coming up. Um pretty soon, actually. So I want to encourage you to get those into the chat box as soon as possible. Kevin, we, um, of course, are really looking forward to the upcoming Family Economics Conference. Uh, you know, I um, mentioned in, in, the, uh, in the introduction that you are the director of Generations with Vision. Can you give us a little bit more of what you guys are about and how people can connect with you? Sure. Generations with Vision is a ministry de- dedicated to preserve the American family, the Christian family, in education, economics, uh, both areas. We we believe that uh, that that education and economics are critical issues. Critical issues. Education is important because uh, many of our families are seeing their children walk away from the faith uh, because of a counter worldview that is being taught in education. We think education is a core core area of the worldview battle, especially as as we're seeing a breakdown of the Christian faith. I wrote a book called Apostate that just came out recently, uh, outlining how the faith, the Christian faith, has very much dissipated in the the, the Christian West, Europe, Canada, and America. And I, I really, from the bottom of my heart, want to salvage some, a few, at least a few Christians, maybe more than a few Christians, uh, by the year twenty one hundred. I, I I know we're in the greatest apostasy in the history of the Christian faith. The millennial generation is walking away from the faith wholesale. But I, I I want to salvage something of the Christian faith, and one of the ways we do this is by bringing a distinctive Christian education and challenging parents to give their children a Christian education in, in the midst of all of this. And uh, and so Generations is, is dedicated to, to, to that message. Uh, we're also dedicated to preserve the family economically. We, we think the families are going to be hurting economically in the years to come, largely because of the breakdown of character, the breakdown of education, the breakdown of discipleship and mentorship for young men, uh, and, and also just just the breakdown of the macro American economy. You can't run a nation into $180 trillion in debt indefinitely without the Piper invoicing eventually. So I'm convinced that we have to build a parallel economy right now to salvage the Christian family in the years to come, and and hence the uh, the family economic conferences. Uh, so so yeah, that's that's the the focus of generations. We're focused on reintegrating the family in education, preserving the family in education, and reintegrating in the family in the area of economics. And uh, what's the website that people can uh, go to to find out more? Our website is generationswithvision.com or generationsradio.com, or you can use my name, kevinswanson.com. Excellent. And let me just say, on behalf of Christian Heritage Home Educators of Washington, we are super excited about teaming with you guys for the Family Economics and Mentorship Conference. And I know that Danny's been doing a lot of heavy lifting for us behind the scenes, and we are all looking forward to families catching the vision. Uh, give us a sneak. Danny Craig's great. Yeah, I know he is. Danny Craig's great, and so is the whole <laughs> Craig family and and the whole old team up there with Washington Heritage. Uh, boy, it's amazing what's happened. We, we this is the first time we busted out a conference. What like two months before the conference starts? Uh, but I think we do have some open spots, if I'm not mistaken. But we're almost completely and utterly full for the Ocean Shores conference. That is a true statement. Uh, give us a sneak peek, if you could, at some of the topics that you'll be covering. Well, our Family Economics and Mentorship Conference at Ocean Shores, October 11th and 12th, is going to look at uh, mentorship, obviously. Family Economics will have some vision there, but a lot of nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. A lot of this is how to do it. This is how to incorporate sons and daughters. This is how to start a family business from the bottom up. Uh, We'll we'll find out what other families are doing. We we, we love to do the panels. There'll be lots and lots of panels uh, to find out how people – uh, work their way from the, the corporate scene more into a family-based economy. We'll, we'll have stuff on how, on how daughters are incorporated into this. Uh, we'll have some things on mentorship. 
and and how to find good mentorships and how to make the best of, of good mentorships. Um, this this is going to be, I think, the the way in which we salvage our kids. You can't just dump your kid into college, uh, pay your eighty thousand dollars, close your eyes, and bite your lip real hard and hope and hope and hope and pray that somehow everything's going to turn out on the other side. You, you can't do that anymore. We we got to get out of the box when it comes to launching our kids into the macro economy. My encouragement encouragement is is to is to catch the mentorship vision develop a family economy right now work the merging into the macro economy by working that family economy from the time your kids are 8 10 12 14 16 18 years of age excellent Okay, we're coming right back with Kevin Swanson in just a moment. This is the part of the program, though, where we uh, take a quick commercial break and allow our live attendees to get their last-minute questions in for the Q&A session with Kevin Swanson. If you are catching this episode as a recording and you're thinking to yourself, hey, I'd like to be part of the live recording too, simply surf on over to christianheritageonair.com and sign up. It's super easy and You can't beat the price. (laughs) It doesn't cost anything. Coming down the Christian Heritage Pike as we record on August 27th, 2013. You know, we've talked about the Family Economics Conference, October 11 and 12. Get signed up. Kevin Swanson will be there. Danny Craig will be there. I'll be there with my man on the street microphone. And of course, R.C. Sproul Jr., Eric Weir, Diego Rodriguez, Steve Riddell, and Dave Tucker. It's ChristianHeritageOnline.org. Don't delay. Speaking of Dave Tucker, he's joining us on the next program here on Christian Heritage On Air, which is set to record live on November 19th, 2013, 7 p.m. Pacific. Our topic, basic training, how to teach your kids to work. After all the great vision we'll be receiving at the Family Economics Conference, Monday morning we'll roll around and we'll be back in the trenches of daily discipleship and homeschooling. And some of us, invariably, myself included, will be wondering... How to get from A to Z in raising kids will be productive servants of Jesus Christ. Dave Tucker will help us navigate this challenge. Be sure to mark your calendars and join us for that on November 19th. And then finally, right around the corner, Christian Heritage has their regional kickoff picnics happening on September 7th, 2013 in six different locations in Washington, Ferndale, Puyallup, Battleground, Everett, West Richland, and Spokane. Uh, This is a chance to connect with old friends. This is a chance to meet new friends and build lifelong relationships with people that are on the same page. And, you know, it is simply a great day for fun and fellowship. And if all that weren't enough, well, it's free too. (laughs) Don't forget your lawn chairs, picnic baskets, game supplies, and bring other homeschooling families too. And that is going to be on September 7th. There's more information and details and the ability to RSVP over on the website at christianheritageonline.org. Okay, it's time for the Q&A with Kevin Swanson on family economics. Let's see what questions are coming in. Carrie's helping me here. Um, Kevin, here's one of the questions. What trials can we expect as we move along this path of family economics? Well, I think every homeschooling mom can sort of answer the question when you bring your kids home, uh, you know, where, what, what kind of difficulties you're going to confront. And, and obviously relationships are, are going to be uh, somewhat of a challenge. I, I found that spending more time with my wife introduced s- some issues. You know, I, I noticed that there were some fleshly things on my part that I had to deal with myself. And, and we had to figure out ways in which we could work together and how we best work together. And uh, same thing for our sons and our daughters. It's not always easy to, to work with our sons and our daughters or mentor our sons and our daughters. Uh, but, but what we do is we provide, I think the family economy provides an environment, atmosphere in which uh, we can function, we can develop relationships. Now, the question is, how do you develop those relationships and, and how do you work through difficulties and challenges and such? And generally, I find that as families learn to communicate together, I mean, they just learn how to open up the communication, the back and forth. They, they learn how to, to ask forgiveness and work through, uh, sin issues and, and the rest, uh, generally they're happier at the end of it all. You know? G- generally, even though it's, it's, it may be hard the first couple of months or the first year or two, uh, they find that, that they can work through those problems and, and they come out even more joyful and more, uh, exuberant to work with each other on the other side. And I, so whatever applies to the home school does apply to the larger vision of the family economy, especially in the area of relationships and character building. So, uh, so I, I, I just say, you know, use, apply a lot of prayer 
and and uh, take the time and and learn to love working one with another and appreciate each other's gifts. There's of course so much more to say, but yeah. uh, uh, that's one reason we do panels. Is uh, p- panels bring out all the experiences that various families have had and uh, the challenges they faced, and and you'll find that that a lot of families have 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 done this, and uh, they have they have profited hugely by it. Wow, the questions are really streaming in right now. Um, Carrie's pointing to this one. We're going to go to a question from James. And James says, um, I'm encouraged that many of the things that I'm reading, even from secular observers, are suggesting that this is an optimal time to move into a more family-based entrepreneurial economy. One of the key indicators of this is that numerically, we have been out of, out of recession for quite some time now, but the jobs haven't come back. Many companies use the recession as an opportunity to rely more on software solutions to replace employees and streamline. This is a key indicator that much of the corporate economy is gearing towards jettisoning more and more people. Any thoughts on how this may be a great opportunity to jump into a family-based economy? Well, he's exactly right. Uh, median income has been falling, and uh, contractual opportunities, I think, will grow. But uh, but uh, the, the 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 possibilities of people getting college degrees and getting getting a job just out of the uh, gates is less and less. I think it's something like fifty percent right now are unemployed from the last uh, several years of uh, graduates coming off the uh, the college scene. So so you know, at this point, I'd say you're looking at a a massive economic shift going on right now. And and what one of the interesting articles articles that came out of a British business magazine a couple of years ago. I read it on the air. Uh, they looked at the companies that came out of the Great Recession of 2009 and found that the, the companies that survived the best were family-run companies without exception. That is, family-run companies weather recessions better than anybody else. Why? I think it's because there's more loyalty there, it tends to be a little more resilience, it tends to be uh, uh, more flexibility, and uh, and they're, they're willing to be faithful. They're willing to be loyal to each each other and uh, they're willing to hang on no matter what happens and they tend to come through recessions better than other uh, companies do. So so right now I think is the best time, the very best time to start building more family oriented businesses and family oriented economies and uh, and I, I'm, I'm hearing that testimony everywhere I go. I think the family based economy is the basic economy that will help salvage things, especially with uh, this this debt based economy that is 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 not doing well right now. I, I would I would have expected that we'd be able to deal with our debt uh, coming out of the 2009 recession, but, uh, but not so. We're, we're getting further and further into debt, and unemployment rates have not improved. And here's the kicker. The unemployment rates for young children, young people, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22 years of age, is, is, is twice as bad as it was in 2001. It has not recovered since the 2009 recession. Uh, the, the, big, the big issue here, the big takeaway here, is that for young people, uh, un- unemployment ratios are going to be eventually, I think, as high as they are in Greece and Spain, which is uh, 30, 40 percent. That's what's going to happen here in the United States. Uh, underemployment and unemployment for youth right now, I think, is somewhere around 30 to 40 percent if you include underemployment. Um, and it, it, it may be even higher for, uh, for high school graduates. Okay, we we got a lot of questions here, and we're trying to sort through these. I want to try to get to all of them if we can. Um, we have a question from from Judson. He, he says, "For those of us that have always lived in the corporate mindset, could you give us some examples of what some families have done to build a family economy?" I have the vision and desire, but it is hard to change the mindset. Well, I I really believe that. One of the key things is to build parallel income streams uh, early on and parallel ministries and such early on. I did that in the 1990s. It means you can't watch television. You come home from your corporate job, you're going to have to work your other projects with your family side by side. And uh, that's the kind of thing I did through the 1990s and jumped ship from the corporate world in 1999. But uh, what I would suggest is that that you start working these things on the side. Uh, I think it helps to be debt free. We taught we usually have some some sessions on how to get debt free, uh, how to pay off mortgages, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, but try to build in flexibility and uh, and 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 develop taste for freedom and uh, and entrepreneurism as best as you can. Let's uh, jump to this uh, question from Chris. Chris says, "What counsel do you give to families seeking to create a family economy to get out of debt?" and refuse any future debt in order to accomplish this? 
Well, boy, the debt-free life is 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 critical, and uh, it's something that that God gave us early on. My wife and I both were committed to that, and we were able to take care of our mortgage debt pretty early on in, in our marriage. Uh, we weren't particularly rich, but we were, you know, engineer, nurse kind of thing, and and just I lived on rice and beans uh, most of the years between when I graduated from college and got married. So I was able to save a great deal of money, and I I, I really challenge young people, especially, to to get this vision at 15 years of age. Uh, I've I've told a lot of young people if 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 they decide not to play video games for 20 hours a week. You know, just 20 hours a week, that extra 20 hours out of the 96 waking hours, if they, if they take the, those, those 20 hours a week, just 20 out of the 96 waking hours from Monday to Saturday, if they take 20 hours a week and they will go work in a subway for 10 bucks an hour, uh, they could pay off a house. They could pay off a basic property within 10 years by the time they're 25 years of age. Uh, so, so you know, there's an example, a 15-year-old kid with a, a vision who just saved his money and saved his money on a 20-hour week, $10 an hour job for the time he's 15 years of age, could pay off a house by the time he gets married. Uh, you know, that kind of thing really, really helps. Now, if you're if you're already married, you've got some things going, there's, there's only two things to do, and that is to reduce expenses and to increase income, obviously. Um, but uh, but there are a few other mechanisms by which that could happen as well. Uh, but but it has to be a value, and I think it has to be a value with both a, a father and mother, and 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 it also helps sometimes to downsell and and to to you know get get, get into a house that's maybe a little bit more doable. It's maybe uh, a, a bit out of town. Uh, I brought my four hundred one k and my IRA to bear and bit the bullet on capital gains and bit the bullet on uh, the the penalties and such. But uh, but uh, you know I, I just did it. And, uh, and paid off the house and, and made it happen because the most important asset you have as a family economy is the dirt on which you have your house. Uh, that becomes that house, that ministry center, that, that basic property becomes your most important tool uh, for your family economy. So that's why I put all of my resources to bear on my house early on, paid off that house, and then moved on to other things. The neat thing about being debt free is it frees you up to do so many other things. Uh, I think it, I think as a free man, uh, you, you tend to be a better entrepreneur, a, a clearer thinker, uh, a, a guy who's willing to take risks. Uh, you, a lot of other things come into play if you're debt free or mortgage free on your house. Uh, there's, there's some intangibles that kick in. If you're debt free on that house. So that's, that's just a, a, a few points that I can give you right now. Come to the conference though. We have a lot of stuff on, on debt free living. All right. That's some great information. Um, I'm going to read Holly's question here, but I'm going to rephrase it a little bit. Uh, she basically says, you know, at what point ought someone to just pick up and relocate out of state? Uh, for, for example, say a single mom having trouble finding mentors for her son. Well, man, Holly, I would tell you, you got to find a church that's willing to to provide something in terms of mentorship and discipleship uh, for your sons. I, I I would say that's that's just incredibly critical. Um, now, it doesn't mean that you have to leave the state necessarily. It may mean you have to let your fingers do the walk and do some talking and some phone calling. But but you got to find a church with a heart for the single moms and for especially the sons of single moms because that discipleship that mentorship so critical so incredibly critical I've given up five years of my life in fact right now uh, tonight I had a son of a single mom at our table uh, he was right there with us and uh, he's been working side by side with me today uh, but this is this is all part of the vision of the church if the church is not into mentoring the sons of single moms the fatherless that's not really a very good church I mean if you want to get involved in true religion. Uh, you got to find a church that that really gets involved with the fatherless. Okay, uh, I'm going to combine two questions here. This one's uh, kind of a, a morphing of of, of uh, is this Brett and Sean's? I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> how do we guide the career paths of our sons? Well, boy, that's been a, a challenge for me because my son is not going to be doing exactly what I've done. But one thing is for sure: you've got to get him into something. I mean, anything. When he's 14 or 15 or 16, get him into something. I got him editing my radio program, and believe it or not, that turned out to be pretty much what he likes doing more than anything else. He's a good marketer. He's a great administrator. He's a good manager. He's He's got a lot of skills. He's got a lot of people skills, but he really, really enjoys the creativity of video and audio editing, and he has probably edited about 3,000 radio programs since he was 11 years old. He can do it in his sleep. He's good at it. Uh, so he knows what he likes to do. And I think the reason he knows is because we just jumped into something. He started doing it. And now he, he's come to the conclusion that he likes 
video editing, and he does a very, very good job with it. So, so I, I think the key thing is just do something. Just do something and then begin to morph into other things as you go. The neat thing about family economy is you can add new projects uh, pretty much any time, especially if you're a multi-stream family income deal. Mm, absolutely. Here's um, a question from Kathleen. What are your thoughts on the family economy when a son marries? Do they launch off to start their own economy? When do they start spinning off on their own? You know, different families do things in different ways, and we need to allow for all kinds of liberty. As I said, in any of this, we have to add, allow for liberty. My, my point is, let's get the family economy together, let's get the vision together, and let's start training our boys as early as 8 or 10 or 12 years of age with uh, this vision in mind. Um, I, I think, generally speaking, you're, you're working at, at, mer- at, at moving your son into his own economy uh, as he approaches marriage. And this might maybe two years before, this may be three years before, this may be a year before. Um, I, one of the reasons for the engagement period, by the way, uh, because a lot of times in the, in the olden days, they would, they would get betrothed and then they would have a period of time in which they would establish their home and their family economy. So there would be, you know, maybe a six month period or a year period where they had that promise. They had effectively taken the marriage vows called the betrothal, but there would be a period of time in which the, the woman would still stay, stay in her father's house until the young man had his father's, his own family economy nailed down. So that was what the betrothal period was about. Um, I, I think you just have to, you know, find out from your son when he wants, wants to get married. My son wants to get married actually fairly soon here. And so my encouragement to him is to really work hard on establishing his own family economy and his own vision and his own income sources. And, uh, and, and I work with him on that just about every week. In fact, I sat down with him yesterday and worked through some of his goals. And uh, he, is, he is definitely focused on, on starting his own family economy. Question from Deanne, Uh, Proverbs 31 wife, mom, managed multiple businesses. Apparently, her husband gave her a lot of freedom to make decisions on her own regarding her businesses. She stayed balanced with charity, family, meals, creativity. Can you give us some thoughts on that, Kevin? That's beautifully stated. I think the real issue is trust there. Uh, By the way, one of the best examples of a Proverbs 31 woman in the history of America is bar none. Abigail Adams, the, the, the wife of John Adams. You've got to read the biography of John Adams and especially keep an eye on the, the life of Abigail Adams and her contribution to her husband and to her husband's family economy. She took care of the fields. She managed the fields. She bought new fields. She took care of charitable interests of, of the widows in the area. Uh, amazing, amazing story. Abigail Adams is, I think, the quintessential Proverbs 31 woman. But uh, we don't see this very much anymore. We're just, I think, right now trying to recapture it out of the whole postmodern existentialist, live for yourself, get your own career career job worldview that's been imposed on us through universities and media and et cetera for the last 50 years. But really, we need to get back to this beautiful picture of what it is to be a Proverbs 31 woman. And I know that, you know, our, our daughters and our wives are all just trying to get a, a picture of it and trying to fulfill that in some way or another. Uh, she is sort of the optimum woman, surely. But, uh, but here's, I think, the key thing uh, that would address the question, and that is her husband really trusted in her. The heart of her husband safely trusted in her so that he would have no need to spoil. The, the key issue was was trust. And I think in the family economy, you have to build that trust. Interestingly enough, marriages tend to fall apart. In fact, the number one factor in, in bringing marriages down tends to be the area of finances and disagreement in the area of finances. And, and that, I think, points out how weak the family economy is in the present day. So really, I think what we're really trying to do in all this is to build a unified family economy where, yes, a wife submits to her husband, but she's able to do so many different things because she has, she has that trust relationship with him. And, and she, he has seen her loyalty and her desire and her hard work and her, her wisdom and all the things that she has employed to, uh, to manage the family economy and to be, as Paul calls her, an oikos despoteo, uh, a, a despot or a manager of the family economy. Let's see if we can't get uh, this one here from two more. See, one from Charlie here. What kinds of health insurance are available for integrated families? 
Oh boy, that's uh, that's a very important aspect of all of this. Uh, and with Obamacare coming down like a freight train, this is opening up so many more opportunities for family economies. Because remember, uh, with the with the corporate requirement of fifty employee plus requiring this very very rigid form of 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 insurance that will require abortifacients and all the other things that are a horrible, abominable violation to the Christian conscience. I think you're going to see lots and lots and lots of individuals. And 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 small businesses saying we're gonna we're gonna really focus on building family economies. We are not going to build large corporate structures because we cannot submit ourselves to the Obamacare mandate. And that's why the Christian Medical Sharing Ministries are so very, very important. They're working great for family economies right now. In fact, for, for small family economies, they're ideal. Um, the, the Christian Medical Sharing Ministries were exempted in the Obamacare bill, and that was a beautiful exemption that was put in. And again, giving Christian families freedom not to submit themselves to a welfare system, not to submit themselves to a system uh, that, that requires uh, all kinds of extra coverage. And right now, the estimates are that the average family is going to be paying between twenty four and thirty thousand dollars for the health insurance. It's outrageous. Well, the Christian Medical Sharing Ministries are are charging somewhere around three to four thousand dollars a year. I mean, that's going to be like you know one eighth of whatever insurance is is, is these this Obamacare mandate insurance is going to require of the average family. So so one of the important aspects of our of our family economics conferences is to address uh, the family economy in the area of healthcare. And this huge, huge issue for us, and we really are trying to direct uh, families more and more towards Samaritan Ministries and uh, and Christian Medical Sharing Ministries like that. So I again recommend that people check out SamaritanMinistries.org dot uh, org for more information on on I think what 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 really needs to be the the future for family economies and for Christian families in America who want to be free and 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 want a Christian worldview. Uh, in the area of their medical care. I agree. Absolutely. Let's, uh, let's go ahead and wrap up the Q and a with this question from David and David, I'm going to just kind of modify your question just a little bit to fit better here. But, um, how do we define success and keep the Lord central in all of this? You know, I'll tell you folks, that's probably the, the central issue that is pounded home in our keynote sessions we are to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of the material things are added unto us. The real focus is not money. The focus is not to get your kids into a good college and to get your kids a good job in order to make a lot of money. That isn't where we begin when we talk as Christians about the, the future economies of our children and our own family economies. Our, our real focus, our real heart needs to be where? The kingdom of God. Our real heart needs to be where? I just, I just want to find ways in which I can disciple my kids. A real focus needs to be, uh, I need to disciple the nations. I, I need to find ways in which we as a family can, can minister more and more to neighbors and to clients and so forth and so on. I need to find ways in which we can be free to, to express God's laws and God's principles in our economies rather than be subjected to large corporate structures that are constantly trying to violate God's laws in as many ways as possible. See, ultimately it has to start with a, a desire to seek God's kingdom and his standards of righteousness first. That needs to be our passion. If that's our passion first, I think God's going to reward us with the kind of family economies and the remunerations, the physical blessings uh, that that uh, that flow from it. But but we're not to seek the physical remuneration first. We're to seek His will. We're to seek His kingdom first. And so it doesn't really matter how you run your economy specifically. What really matters is that you seek His kingdom first. And and I think the family economy is a great way in which that can happen. Excellent. Kevin Swanson of Generations with Vision, thank you so much for taking time out of your schedule to join us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you in Ocean Shores. Thank you so much, Dr. Lamar. God bless Christian Heritage. Keep up the good work out there. Hey, you know what? And I know you can do this, but uh, as we wrap up our time tonight, I want you to give us a final word to take us out. Well, we are going through some amazing, difficult 
confrontationally uh, uh, challenging uh, experiences, I think, in, in terms of the economy and where this nation is headed. Uh, there's never been a more important time in which we, we can launch out uh, and seek the kingdom of God and find ways in which we can salvage our future families, our future family economies as now. This is the time to do it. Um, we're, we're not seeing that the, the secular schools, the universities, and the political systems and such are doing what is necessary to preserve our economies and, and, and our political state. Uh, So let's start building godly families and godly uh, Christian economies right now by by our family economic systems. All right, everyone. That music is a sign that this episode of Christian Heritage On Air is coming to a close. Once again, I want to thank our guest, Kevin Swanson, for joining us on the program. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you so much. It's been a blast. You can find out more about Kevin Swanson and his radio program over at generationswithvision.com. As a reminder, Kevin will be at the upcoming Family Economics and Mentorship Conference, and I'm sure he'd be delighted to meet you in person. ChristianHeritageOnline.org is the website to get you dialed in and signed up. Keep in touch with us with your feedback and comments over at ChristianHeritageOnAir.com. We're here to serve you as you move through your family discipleship and homeschool journey. Thank you to Danny for all of his expert behind-the-scenes work and Thank you to my wife, Carrie, for helping me to multitask this evening. And thank you to everyone on the board for this fantastic opportunity to serve. So until next time, this is Dr. Thomas Lamar. And may God bless you as you diligently pass on a vibrant Christian heritage to your children for God's glory. Good night, everybody, and God bless. For more information on this Christian Heritage program, find them on the Internet at ChristianHeritageOnline.org. This program is produced by Christian Heritage Home Educators of Washington, copyright 2013. Alrighty, great work, everybody. Uh, for those of you that are still online, uh, we just wanted to give you a moment to join us in our uh, green room. Dr. Lamar, great work. I think uh, the Lord blessed that webinar. Thank you very much. And I, I give all the props to my wife, Carrie. She was whispering in my ear the whole time. <laughs> you know, that was uh, one of the things that was unique about this webinar. We had so many questions pouring in. Uh, I think this will definitely be our uh, go-to webinar for people that want to get their questions answered about family economies. I mean, covered A to Z with all those great questions that you all provided. So thank you for helping us out in that way. That's uh, the benefit of being live and you helped us create all that great content for all the families, hopefully hundreds of families that will listen uh, in the months and even years to come. So thanks for joining us tonight and uh, God bless. Have a great evening.